First up, I have an article that brings up an interesting point. Of course, the name of it is 2025, The Year With You I Died. A little bit tongue in cheek, but like I said, it brought up an interesting point that I was like, huh. And I want to get your guys' thoughts on it. So from Jacob here, 2025, the year SwiftUI died. And he starts off with just a basic overview of SwiftUI from 2019. In iOS 13, brand new, it was pretty rough. iOS 14, it became much more stable. And then by the time you could target iOS 15 plus, iOS 16 plus, SwiftUI was good to go, production ready for the vast majority of apps. And like you said, you were just churning out screens like a maniac. And this is part of the point here. And then he fast forwards to 2025, I like this, like all great writers. My story has a six year time skip because 2025, like things changed and UI kit might be a more interesting option for some apps, not for everyone. Because as Jacob says, like two things happened this summer. The iOS 17 at observable macro was ported to UI kit and we'll go down here. Secondly, agentic AI tools took off in a big way. Codex and all that stuff, you know, it's writing all your code for you because that was one of the major downsides to UIKit once SwiftUI came along. Just all that boilerplate code, especially if you're doing programmatic UI, all those constraints. SwiftUI had these nice, clean, simple to use APIs much less code, much easier to pump out some screens. But he also points out people use iOS because it's fast, responsive, great animations. And he said, when you drill down to those three pillars of what makes you know iOS good to use, there's a pretty big gap between UIKit and SwiftUI when it comes to performance. So is SwiftUI ready for production? People have been asking that for years. Yes, for the vast, vast majority of apps, unless your app was very performance heavy, then maybe UIKit might've been their better way to go in general. But here's the interesting question, right? SwiftUI suffers worse performance out of the box due to all the diffing, view states, dynamic layout, all that stuff. And this is a fundamental architectural choice, like he says, and it will never quite be as fast as UIKit because of that. But everybody forgave SwiftUI shortcomings because of the undeniable boost to development speed. Like you said, cranking out screens like a maniac, the tidy, easy of use APIs. Like it was just so much easier to build, so much faster to build in SwiftUI rather than UIKit. Again, boilerplate, cumbersome, so much code. But what happens when you're no longer writing every line of code manually, right? The AI is writing it. And UIKit has been around forever. So the AI has been trained on just tons of UIKit code. So that's the interesting question. Now that you don't have to write all that boilerplate and UIKit is more performant, should you go back to using UIKit now that you can have AI write all that code and you get all that performance? Well, I don't think it's that simple. Personally, I'm not gonna go back to UIKit because yeah, even if the AI is like writing all that code, I believe, just my opinion, you still have to maintain that code base. You still have to work in that code base. You still have to know what's going on in that code base. And going back to that UIKit world, it's not a world I wanna live in. But I will caveat it with the apps I'm building and I make, aren't super performance heavy, right? They're pretty straightforward apps. They don't rely on powerhouse performance. So for those apps that do need that performance, again, this is like an interesting question. Now that developer speed may not be so much of an issue because you're not writing all that boilerplate, is UIKit a valid option for you? I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. A quick note, if you wanna go deeper with me in Swift, SwiftUI, building apps, I offer a variety of iOS developer courses at seanallen.teachable.com. I also offer my source code there. If you don't wanna watch the videos, you just want the code for all my courses, all my YouTube tutorials, and you can book a call with me if you wanna talk about anything iOS dev related. Career, code review, your app, AI, all that stuff. You can check all that out at seanallen.teachable.com. Next up, we have an article from Apple, discover how apps are using the new design in liquid glass. And basically what this is, it's a short visual article showcasing how certain apps are utilizing liquid glass in iOS 26 and how their design has improved. The example here with Crumble Cookies is how their content really shines through edge to edge on the screen so there's no toolbar at the top. And here with Tide Guide, they show you some interactive charts using liquid glass. We'll keep scrolling down. But again, as you can see, it's short, very visual, just showing examples. Like I love this control, right? You got that liquid glass on the edge of the control as they're scrubbing through that. That's really cool. And then here, this astronomy app has some nice custom uh, menus here that are morphing with the liquid glass and changing. Again, just to give you inspiration on how best to use liquid glass, get some ideas. Apple is showcasing some really cool apps and how they're using it. Moving on, we got another live stream from Apple. They're doing a lot of these lately, but this one is optimize your app speed and efficiency. And I highly recommend you watch it. It is two hours long. Uh, this is gonna be kind of small to see, but they're optimizing the power with the new liquid glass design, generating fast responses with foundation models, a deep dive into Swift UI performance. So 
definitely watch this video. And just like last episode with the foundation models code along, there was a Q&A at the end of the live stream, but for this video, it's not there. So Anton, just like he did last time, grabbed all the questions in the Q&A and has them here in an article. Again, I'm scrolling through fast to show you. There's a bunch of questions. A lot of them are very specific. Um, like if I go back to the top, they're talking about passing along closures and, and SwiftUI's diffing, like how it's hard to compare closures when you pass an action from a view. Anyway, like I said, there's very specific questions. So watch this performance video. You're definitely gonna get something to improve your apps. And then, you know, skim through these questions here, because again, these are very specific questions. They may not be general applicable to everyone, but sometimes those are the best list of questions because you may have this niche problem, this niche question, and it gets answered in one of these. So check that out and improve the performance of your apps. Next up, we have the 2026 Swift Student Challenge. And if you're not familiar with this, well, submissions are open February 6th to the 28th. So start working on your apps, get them ready to submit. But as you can see here in this picture, the students that are declared the winners, and if we go to the criteria here for the winners, Swift Student Challenge winners will be selected based on submissions that demonstrate excellence in innovation, creativity, social impact, inclusivity. And then from this esteemed group, we'll name distinguished winners and you get to go to Apple and Cupertino for three incredible days. Here they are at WWDC. I think you get to meet Tim Cook. Maybe that's not guaranteed, but I know a lot of the Swift Student uh, Challenge winners did get to meet uh, Tim Cook. So that's pretty cool. And again, submissions are open February 6th to the 28th. So you got a few weeks to get that out ready. Next, we have an article from Daniela here, Indie Alone and Figuring It Out. And this just this hit me in the feels. This is my life. I've been Indie since summer of 2019. So I don't even, what is that, six, six and a half years now? And uh, it's not for everyone. And that's kind of what this article points out. Daniela says, going Indie is exciting. Yeah, total freedom, no nine to five, no meetings, just building your own app. I imagine quiet mornings, deep focus, full control over my day. And some of that is true, but once you're actually doing it, you know, there's a whole other side of things. And this article goes through that. So I wanted to share this. If you are thinking about going indie, it's kind of one of those things where like, okay, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Or if you just started your indie journey, here's some things to like look out for. Or if you've been doing indie for a while, you can just commiserate with us and be like, yeah, this, this is what it is. Um, so yeah, you're on your own, right? Being independent is a dream many have. You work on your own product, your own app. There is no nine to five. You make your own schedule. You're doing all the work, you own the product, you do design, you do marketing, you do customer support, like you do everything. And it can be lonely, right? Working alone, you have no colleagues to talk to, no one to ask questions, no one to bounce off, like no just BSing at the office. And like, yeah, you can't have Slack or discords with other indie devs, but that's just, that's just not the same. Again, back to like you're doing everything, you have to do the marketing, the design, the product. But this is the main thing I wanted to point out. She says, time is everything because this is the hardest part. The hardest part isn't the work, I agree with that. It's choosing what to work on. And that sounds like a blessing. Sounds awesome. Like, oh, I get to pick what I want to work on when I want to work on it. That's awesome. Not as easy as it sounds because at least what I've found is most of the time, and literally most of the time, like it's not all fun. The stuff that you need to be working on, you should be choosing to work on, isn't um, that fun or exciting. It's the boring stuff. But because you can do all those things, like the, the marketing, the design, the product, building a new app, building a new idea, you don't have a boss telling you what to do, right? You have to be very disciplined because what I struggle with is so much of the fun stuff, the interesting stuff, the stuff that really has my mind going, that's like intellectually stimulating, that's not usually what needs to be done most of the time. What needs to be done most of the time is the boring, repetitive, just mundane work if you wanna be successful. And I struggle with that. That is like really hard to do. Because also a lot of the time is you're trying to walk this balance, is this balance between what makes money and what is fun and fulfilling and makes me happy with what I'm working on. Because a lot of times what makes money isn't like super fulfilling. So if I optimized purely for profit, maximizing money, I would probably hate my life. That's not the work I wanna do. But on the flip side of that is if you optimize strictly for fun, intellectual simulation, like awesome, that might not make that much money. So you have to find this balance and it, it's, it's hard. <laughs> like it is not easy. Now, I also wouldn't trade it. Like I, I know I've just kind of been pointing out like the downsides, I, like I've been ruined, like I'm unhirable. Like you, you, you can't go back once you've done this, even though it is hard and requires a lot of discipline. Um, so yes, I, I would not trade it, even though I have been kind of just complaining for uh, a little bit here. And I'll continue with that complaining because like she says, time is everything. Because what's nice about the nine to five is like you go do your job, whether it's in an office or remote, you clock in, you clock out. And when you clock out, like now your time is yours. Like you can work on your own side project. You can go play sports, you can play video games, do your hobbies, hang out with your family. Like you can shut your brain off from, from work. 
most of the time. When you're indie, like you do, it just never shuts off. Like you're, there's always something you could be doing. You always feel behind. You always feel like you're not using your time wisely. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a heavy, heavy burden. But like I said, I, I wouldn't trade it. So again, if you are thinking about going indie, definitely read this article. Um, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Make sure you're prepared for that. And uh, like I said, if you've been indie for a while, then you know what this is all about. And lastly, if you're building your own app, I got a nice thread from Ciro here. 100 lessons from bootstrapping my app to a seven figure exit. And like the title says, it's 100 little lessons. Your onboarding is your first date with your user. Don't blow it. This is arguably the single most critical flow in your entire app. And that is true because I don't know the exact stat, but it's like something like 80% of people that download your app never come back on the second day. Like day one is like all you get. So you have to make that first impression like really matter because the vast majority of people aren't even coming back after the first day. Stop selling features during onboarding, sell the benefit. These are pretty classic uh, advice. But again, it's hundred of them. There's a lot of good gems in here. This one here, number 31, I want to point out. I actually was like, oh, I need to do that right now. When a user clicks contact support, you know, you pull up the email sheet and usually I, I, what mine does is mine fills out like the subject for it, but you can go even further. Populate the email with their device model, OS version and app version. Like that saves countless back and forth emails and you can provide faster, more effective support. You already know, again, what app version they're on, what OS version, you already have all that information. So that's a good one. And then replying to reviews, both good and bad, it does, it shows you're listening and it's happened to me before. And it's not uncommon. I know a lot of other developers have had this. If you reply to a one-star review, like a legit one-star review, not like, why isn't this app free? But like a legit one-star review and you reply and like kind of explain what's going on or, you know, just acknowledge their issue. A lot of times they'll change that one-star review to a higher one. I mean, you can't get worse, right? Even if they change it from a one to a two, that's a big deal. But a lot of times it'll be from a one to a three or a one to a four, maybe even a one to a five. And that's a huge turnaround just by replying to the reviews. So anyway, great thread here from Ciro. There's a hundred of those tips. If you're building your own app, definitely got to check that out. That wraps it up for this episode of Swift News. See you in the next one.